Well, greetings in the Lord from Christ Church. As I said, we are also there right now worshiping the same risen Christ. And I know that they send their love as well. Now, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, so please, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6. So please turn to Ephesians 6 in your Bibles or turn your attention to the screens. And we will be reading from verses 5 through 9. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, starting in verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them. And stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I know TJ is preaching in Alabama, but I hope that he catches up the live stream later. And I just want to say thank you, TJ, for inviting me to preach and giving me a passage on slavery. And (laughs) we'd like to um, formally invite you to preach at Christ Church on the Song of Solomon anytime you want, (laughs) because turnabout is fair play. (laughs) Now, by way of introduction, and I don't mean to start kind of cheekily because this is a serious thing. By way of introduction, I do want to address some of the big questions that are going to be in a lot of our minds and in some of our minds more than others. And I want to kind of not get those out of the way, not dismiss them, but understand them so that we can be ministered to by God's word without distraction. So the first thing that we need to know is that Paul is talking here about slaves and masters. The word in English in this version is translated bond servants. It's the word doulos. It's the word everywhere used for slave. So first century slavery has more in common with 21st century employment than it does with the shadow slave trade from America. But it's still slavery. And I know that's going to hit different for some of us. I know. So what I want to say is that there's something relatable in this for us. If it's like employment, then there's something we can relate to, but there's also something detestable in this. This is Paul engaging with a social institution that he dislikes in the Lord, that he despises in the Lord. And Paul, too, wants to see it wither by the power of the gospel. So that's the first thing we need to address. The second thing flows out of that, and it's the big question Then, if this is a passage about slavery, but Paul's not saying let's abolish slavery in so many words, does the Bible condone slavery? Short answer, no. Medium answer, the Bible actually condemns slavery, but it does it in the same inside-out way that Jesus condemns sin. So we expect Paul, when he's like, hey, I'm going to talk about slavery, we're like, okay, Paul, you're going to go on a rampage against this institution. You're going to come at it, guns blazing, and then we'll reform and, you know, make it crumble. And that's not how it works because that's like Peter expecting Jesus to lead a military coup against their Roman oppressors. That's like Peter striking off the ear of Malchus, the the priest's servant, and Jesus puts the ear back on and says, that's not how the kingdom of God works. social transformation that we want and that Paul wants and that Jesus wants, the refining or the overturning of faulty or evil human institutions, it does not start with military action and it does not start with social agendas or politics. It starts with the gospel in the heart. You and God, personal transformation. And when I say personal transformation, I don't just mean, you know, becoming a better you, a better version of yourself. I'm talking about becoming a new you by the power of the gospel so that you 
has died. And now you in Christ are alive by faith. That's what I'm talking about. And when that is true of you, when you can say with Paul, I have been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, then the way that you live is totally different. It spills out into your relationships. It seeps into the social institutions of which you are a part. And it transforms them. For instance, uh, we'll get to this a little bit more later, but in verses five through eight, that's, this is Paul talking to slaves, bond servants, about how to submit to their masters as unto the Lord. And then here in verse nine, he says, masters do the same. Whoa. Masters are also to, to submit. The gospel does such a thing in the heart of the Christian servant and of the Christian master that they start to submit to each other. And no institution like slavery can withstand that for long. Paul here is sowing the gospel seeds that will erode the foundation of this corrupt institution. Now those of you who've been around these past weeks in the Ephesians series will know that the first three chapters of Ephesians are just drenched in the gospel. It's Paul's sort of indicative. Here's what's true of you in Christ. It's beautiful, it's stunning, it's full of words like lavish and rich and wealth and love and grace. And the second three chapters, they don't move on from that, they apply that to you. So the, the section that we're in now is Paul saying, you've received all this grace, peace through grace. Now how do you live in light of that grace? That's where we find ourselves today. And so back in Ephesians 5, this, the last two weeks, you know, TJ two weeks ago and Barnabas last week, they've all flowed out of, and this week, flows out of Ephesians 5, where Paul says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, TJ, I think, referenced Keller in saying, this stuck with me, um, don't be drunk like drowning your sorrows, but remember your resources. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he works out what that looks like. And one of those ways is submitting one to another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting one to another out of reverence for Christ. The grace of God in the gospel gives and creates peace in our lives through mutual submission to one another. A lowering of yourself for someone else's sake. So Paul takes that mutual submission idea and then applies it to the three categories that are within a Christian household. Husbands and, well, wives and husbands, children and fathers, and bond servants and masters. So you've seen that in the last two weeks and now we're at the bond servant and masters part. And in our text today then, the point is just so clear that I actually don't want to belabor it with you. I don't want to insult your intelligence assuming that you don't understand this. Work as unto the Lord. We all know that, don't we? We all know when your boss isn't looking, do you just do what you want to do and as soon as he comes back in the room, you like pull up the right tabs and pretend that you were working all along, or do you do the right thing? You work as if God sees you, as if your work is for God and not for man. We, we get this. The problem is we know what to do, but we don't do it. We know what to do, but we struggle to have the actual power, the ability to do it. So Paul doesn't just give us the what to do, he does, but he also gives us the why and the how, and the gospel is the answer to that. So here's what we're gonna look at this morning. These two participles in verse, uh, verses eight and nine, we've got knowing and knowing. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord and knowing that Christ is the Lord of both the slave and the master. Those two knowings give us the power in our doings. That's what we're gonna get after today. So the first point will be uh, you will be rewarded by Christ. And the second point is you belong to Christ. So let's just jump right into point number one. You will be rewarded by Christ. Now, 15 years ago or so, I was working in Washington State for a mini storage facility. And uh, it was a very interesting job, <laughs> interesting season of my life. And uh, so I was, the, I was like the front desk man, I was the maintenance man, I was the only person on the property. But the owner lived about three hours away in Canada. 
and she had security cameras everywhere. <laughs> and there was one, like if this is my desk and I'm sitting here, there's a security camera right here, just pointing down at me, watching me, waiting for me to mess up. And I would finish a project or a task at the desk and the phone would ring <laughs> and I'd take a deep sigh and it, you know, hello, welcome to mini storage, whatever. And she would have called with a list of ways that I had let her down, a list of ways that I had disappointed her. If living as a servant of Jesus Christ is like that, you will never live with integrity. You will never work as unto the Lord. You won't want to. Who wants to serve that master? If you think that Jesus is just watching through his heavenly security cameras, waiting for you to mess up so he can call and chide you, then you're gonna say to him what I said to that boss. I'm out, I quit. I can't do this anymore. Maybe you feel like that today. And if you do, here's the beautiful thing. God, through his word, is about to unsettle you in the best way. God wants to reorient from his word. This is what he does. He reorients our thoughts about God and clarifies them to know what the real Jesus is like. What if instead of waiting to pounce on us, we knew that Jesus was watching and was eagerly waiting to reward you? Isn't that a master you'd be pleased to serve? Yeah. The Bible makes clear that that's the case. We're gonna go through a whole bunch of Bible verses right now to prove that point to you that I'm not making this up or reading into the text. And the reason why I wanna go through so many is because I barely believe this. We don't talk about it very often. I think we're so afraid of the idea of saying anything that's not justification by faith that we avoid thinking about the master in heaven who rewards us. So we're gonna get into that for a minute, okay? Now, the security camera, right? Remember that idea. God is watching, but what is he looking for? Second Chronicles 69 tells us, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Now that word blameless doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't mean that he, there's not something that he could point out that you've done wrong. It means that you're all in with God. Just wholeheartedly for God. That's what he wants from you. We're on the lips of Jesus in Matthew 6, verses three through four, Jesus says, but when you give to the needy, do not left, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. This one unsettled me, Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. That's a crazy word right there, unjust. For God to overlook your works of faith, imperfect though they may be, is injustice. And God is just. He will not overlook the work and the love and faith that his children show. Luke 6, 35, Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. Not mediocre. <laughs> great. Romans 2, 9 through 11. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. I could go on. There's a bunch more, but I think you get the picture. Christ rewards his servants. But that doesn't mean that we can merit, earn, or deserve salvation. 
Just be very clear. We can never do enough good deeds. You can't pile that stack of good things high enough to get to heaven. That's not how this works. But when you receive Jesus' substitutionary death for you as your death was crucified with Christ, and when you receive his life as your life, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, then you are adopted as a child of God. And because you're in Christ, you're rewarded. All those unseen, thankless things that you might do are seen. You're rewarded, imperfect though it may be. My oldest daughter, Catherine, uh, she's just about to turn eight. She loves to cook. I love to cook, so it's a sweet way that we connect together. And her, one of her favorite things is the breakfast table and, and cooking breakfast for the family. And so she'll often cook scrambled eggs. And if you're a parent, then you know that eating eggs that a child has made is, is something like walking through a minefield <laughs> because you never know when you're going to get that crunch. You know, the eggshell in those eggs. But imagine that you go to a restaurant and you, you order scrambled eggs and they come and you've just paid $24 or something for your scrambled eggs and, you know, avocado toast and it comes with eggshell in the eggs. You're going to send that back. And then let's say it comes out again and there's eggshell again. How many times until you say, I'm literally never coming back here? or I'm gonna leave a scathing review on Yelp, or whatever, however you respond to those situations. Your relationship with the restaurant will change or end because it's a consumer relationship. You give them money, they give you eggs. That's how this works. But what if your daughter brings you the eggs? Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna look her in the eye, you're gonna pick out the eggshells, and you're gonna say these are fantastic. Thank you. Good job. If you are trying to earn God's favor and grace and salvation by piling up your good deeds or making him breakfast, then you have a consumer relationship with God and you have not yet encountered the grace of Christ. But if you have received what Jesus did for you, the humbling of the master of heaven, down into death, if you've received that by faith, then you're a child of God. And Jesus has picked all the imperfections out of your works, and he looks you in the eye and says, well done, good and faithful servant. When your heart finally settles on that truth, that Jesus Christ is eager to reward you for your imperfect good works, for your submission when it's hard, when your boss is hard to get along with, your coworkers are difficult, you're arguing at home. The imperfect but faith-filled love that you show for people right then, he can't wait to reward that. When your heart gets down on that truth, you can take this big sigh and you've got power to actually live as unto God, to actually work like Christ is your master. You know, if you've got a difficult boss, this is not going to make him less difficult. It's not going to make her easier to please. But it will reorient who you're trying to please and it will give you the certainty that you have the smile of your father yeah, we need that. You know, my wife stays at home and, and works and teaches our children. Uh, she has the harder job between the two of us. So much of her work is unseen. And I know, because we've been married for a while, that so much of the work that she does, she wishes that I would see. You know what I'm talking about? The things that you do that you're like, I just wish someone would notice how hard I work on that. God sees. I mean, if you're in the kitchen chopping onions and tears running down your face because onions, 
to just to serve and feed your family food that they might say, oh, I don't like onions and pick it out or complain. You need to know that God sees that and accepts it and rewards it. And it doesn't just say that you're going to get something back from God. It's some sort of reward in kind. And I take it to mean that. Every onion you've chopped to love and submit and serve to someone else, that onion gets a, like you get a reward for that onion. You get a reward for that snotty nose you just wiped. That's the master you serve. It's the master who said, what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. Every dinner you've cooked, every diaper you've changed, every nose you've wiped, every spreadsheet you've formatted, every TPS report you've submitted, whatever. I don't know if that's a real thing. It's all for Jesus, though. He receives it as a gift for him. Isn't that a master you could serve? It is Jesus' supreme pleasure to lavish on his children. Let's believe that. That's the first point. How do we work as unto the Lord and not as just to men? It's by knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord. That's a powerful knowing. Point number two, you belong to Christ. To land the plane on this final point, which is the lordship of Jesus, that's what we're really talking about today. We need to see a couple things from the text. And first of all, I want you to know that this word masters here is the same word for the word Lord. They're both kurios, okay? So it hits a little different when you're reading it and, and it's talking about the Lord Jesus and the Lord of this house. Paul is saying to the lords of the households, you, you don't get to treat your bondservants however you want because you both have a Lord. And it's the same Lord. Jesus is your Lord. And when the glory of the Lord, which is revealed most profoundly at the cross of Christ, when the glory of God appears, Isaiah 40 says, the mountains will be made low and the valleys will be lifted up. In other words, the glory of God is the great leveler of humanity. Every lofty person and institution will be humbled and all the lowly will be lifted. That's what the cross of Christ does. So in the workplace, your boss, you know, on the hierarchy of function is up here and you might be down here, you know, cleaning the floors or whatever. And in Christ, your brothers and sisters, the playing field is leveled because we all serve one Lord. The second thing flows out of that reality, and we touched on it earlier, uh, kind of when I first started, um, and that's from verse nine, the first few words, masters do the same to them. So this word same is actually in the plural. It's like a bucket that you can put all the other stuff that we've just talked about into, right? So verses five through eight, he's, talking about all the ways that bond servants should be submitting to Christ through their submission to their masters. But it's all about submission. And now Paul turns to masters and shockingly says, yeah, you do, you do that too. To them. And an institution that's all about a hierarchy of value one person being more important than the other, more valuable, more worthy, more worthwhile, that institution will die when people get transformed by the gospel like that. When the boss submits to the employee, when the husband submits to the wife, mutual submission for the glory of Christ brings social transformation now, telling servants to submit to their masters, that didn't sound crazy to them, right? Uh, you, you bond servants submit to the masters, like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how this relationship works. But telling masters to submit to their slaves, show me a culture that that's not scandalous in. But there is one thing here that's even more scandalous to us particularly today. 
more offensive to our sensitivities than maybe it ever has been in history. And that's the truth, that you belong to someone. You belong to Christ. You might say, I'm an American. Nobody owns me. I'm a free man. I make my own way, right? Not if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're a citizen of heaven before you're a citizen of the U.S. And your freedom is found in slavery to Christ. In his service is perfect freedom. That's why we say that my one comfort in life and death is that I am not my own, but belong to God. Paul said this, we just we read by it because of the word redemption. It's very familiar to Christian ears. But he said this same thing, this radical thing in Ephesians chapter one. He said, in him, that's Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Now, as a side note, if you go to the bank and ask for money, ask for a loan, right? They're going to look at your riches to determine how much they give you, right? Do you have equity? What are your assets? If you go to Christ and ask for forgiveness, he is not looking at your riches. He gives forgiveness according to his riches. And he's the king. I love that. So we have redemption through his blood. What is redemption? Redemption means you've been bought. Purchased. To redeem something is to buy something back. So let's say you, you come on hard times and you, you need some more money. You take a family heirloom to a pawn shop and you sell it to them. And then later, times are better and you go back and you buy back that family heirloom. You've redeemed it. You've bought, you've bought it back. And this helps us re categorize in our minds and hearts what sin really is because Paul says in the book of Romans that when we choose sin, we're selling ourselves to slavery to sin. We're bound by that thing and now we, we, we can do nothing but serve it. And from, that's the story with Adam and Eve and from then on we just keep doing that. So Jesus because the Old Testament is the story of us knowing what we should do and not having the power to do it. So Jesus, the Son of God, became killable. He became human so that he could have blood that he could spill to redeem you from slavery to sin. That's the reason for Christmas. Jesus had to become killable for you so you could belong to God and be free. So if you're a Christian, you belong to God. Praise God, you're not your own. It's our only comfort in life and death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, don't you know, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. That's what he says. In other words, not only is it a comfort that we don't belong to ourselves, it's also making a demand of us, isn't it? You're not your own. Who are you serving? You don't get to live any way you like because you're not a slave to sin anymore. You're bought with a price. Uh, in Acts 20, um, 28, which is something the elders here have been studying and enjoying in the presence of God for years now, Acts chapter 20. In Acts 20, 28, Paul is speaking to the elders of this church at Ephesus, and he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Paul's saying, this isn't delicate, it's not fragile, but I'm gonna give you this thing and I want you to know how precious it is because it's 
It's bought with the blood of the Son of God. That's you. You're precious to God. Not because it, not because you're adorable. <laughs> like sometimes your baby, I can say this, I'm a dad, I got three, right? Sometimes your kids come out and you're like, that ah, he's not adorable yet. <laughs> You know, they're wrinkly and I don't know. Maybe I'm weird. That's not why they're precious to you. They're precious to you because they're yours. They're your kids. Which means you can't get unprecious to God. If you've been bought with his blood, then I don't care. I don't care what you've done this week. You're still precious to God. In Revelation chapter 5, we see John's vision, four uh, living creatures around the throne, and they're praising Jesus, and they're singing a new song. They say, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and this is important, you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. All right, you belong to Christ. If you belonged to a mere human, if I said you belong to whomever, it would only be degrading, demeaning, dehumanizing. This country knows that all too well, or maybe not enough. But if you belong to Christ, you belong to him so that he can make you a king or a queen of new creation. Belonging to Christ gives you your humanity back. Jesus, the divine, eternal, glorious Son of God, put on flesh and became killable for you to redeem you, to buy you back from slavery for God. And so now the spirit of Jesus, this same Jesus is saying to us through Paul, no matter who you are in life, submit to one another. And we don't just have, you know, I don't, I'm convinced in the Bible we don't really get commands from God that he's not willing to do himself. So what gave God the right to say this to us? Philippians 2. Uh, the, the name above every name, like the prince of heaven became a human. He lowered himself. He submitted himself. And then he went even lower, deep down into death for you. He did not exalt himself. He submitted. He lowered himself for you. That's what gives him the right to say this. And that same submission, that gospel of him dying for us is also the power for us to start living like this. We've got to see um, Isaiah 6, you know the passage, I saw the Lord in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory, that passage. John 12 says that's Jesus on the throne. Seated on that throne, glorious robes. And then he gives this cleansing coal to offer forgiveness and mercy to Isaiah. The next chapter in John, John 13, we see that Jesus stand up from his seat, take off his robe, and put on the tunic of a slave, get down on his knees, and cleanse the feet of his friends. In Daniel 7, we see the Son of Man, one like a Son of Man presented before the Ancient of Days, who grants him glory and honor and authority over everything. And in Mark 10, Jesus, calling himself that Son of Man, says the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what earns him the right to tell us to submit one to another. Because he went all the way down. He who was all the way as high and precious and valuable and glorious as could be went all the way down 
for you. When you see that, when your heart begins to enjoy that, to savor that, that's power. That is God giving you faith in your heart and changing you, transforming you with the gospel so that now the thing that we knew we should do, work as unto the Lord, but couldn't do, now we know what to do, we want to do it, and we're doing it. That's God's power in you. And it comes through the gospel. I can't think of any better news for us this morning than the fact that you belong to Christ if you've received him by faith. And that if you belong to Christ, then you belong to the best master and Lord who loves to reward his children. And so in this confession is all of our life, it's all of our dignity, it's all of our joy, it's all of our hope. Jesus is Lord. We confess it with our mouths, we believe it in our hearts, and we're saved. Some of you are wearing shirts that say this right now. You gotta serve somebody, right? Bob Dylan, and he's right. The choice today before you, some of you are being encouraged more and more like in 1 Thessalonians 4. As you're doing it now, do it more and more. But some of you are facing a choice right now. And that choice is not between freedom and serving Christ. You gotta serve somebody. The choice is between serving yourself or serving Christ. How do you make that choice? Well, I would ask you, who's the better master? Who's proved it? How far was that master willing to go for you? How far are you willing to go for you? When I lived for myself, as my own master, which I did for many years before Christ claimed me with the confession that Jesus is Lord. When I lived for myself, here's how far I was willing to go for myself. About an inch. I knew the things I needed to do to be healthy, to flourish, and I still didn't do them. Because we make terrible masters of ourselves. But Christ gave himself up all the way to win you all the way. He's a better master. Let me end with this. In the 2002 movie uh, adaptation of The Count of Monte Cristo, have you all seen that? Jim Caviezel's in it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great movie, even better book. So the main character's name is Edmund, and he, is, he lands on this beach, and he encounters a condemned, chained thief named Jacopo. And Edmund basically says to the guy who chained up Jacobo and condemned him, all right, uh, how, about, how about I fight him? And if I win, you know, he, give, he basically barters. And he, he fights with Jacopo and he does win. And then he demands mercy for the man. He demands freedom. Edmund lives out the gospel to Jacopo. And if you know the movie, then you'll know the scene. Jacopo grabs him by the beard and pulls him close and says, I am your man forever. When you see the mercy and the freedom that Christ has won for you, what other response is there? I'm your man. That's what the gospel does. If you haven't seen that, if you haven't apprehended the mercy of God in Christ, then ignore all the, you know, how to live stuff that we just talked about. You won't be able to. You won't want to. And hear this. The king of the universe is also the lamb of God who was slain for you. And that's the power. That's the power of the gospel. Let me pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your Son to free us. Thanks for loving us enough to want us even when we were so unwantable, where we did nothing to endear ourselves to you. We did nothing but reject you, and you still, you gave Jesus, and Lord Jesus, you bled for us. I'm just, I'm kind of in awe. And Lord, there are people in this room who probably don't know you at all and who probably don't even feel like they're enslaved to anything. And I would ask you for your glory and for their joy and for our joy to free them and to open their eyes and to pour the love that you have for them into their hearts by your spirit to give them faith and to make them come alive because we love them and we don't want to go to you without them. Would you do it for your glory?